There we go. I've been not doing the transcript because it uh, chews up my machine or something like that. I don't quite understand why, but if I'm going to get off, I can just give it a try. So... You can let it chew up somebody else's machine. Well, I think it happened. Well, the, the recording cloud, has so... to be in the cloud, right? If you're going to not be here. Yeah, exactly. No, I recorded to the cloud. I always do. Um, and and I, now I don't see the, the transcript uh, thing, which is very weird. Huh. So there we go. Um, Grace, I'm going to make you host. Okay. And uh, thank you for offering. Uh, this is great. I'm like excited to kick out anybody I don't like. <laughs> I don't think that's ever happened on an OGM call. I don't think we've ever had to kick anybody else out, but I don't know. Gil's phantom note taker is here. Although with, if you're not doing the transcript, at least the note taker could. That's, the note taker will in fact have a transcript. That's true. Yeah. It does a pretty good job of that. I can share that with people. If you want, anybody wants it, let me know. See, we've solved the chewing up the computer problem, Jerry. There we go. Um, I We are going to head out and go see the, the, the town. So I'm going to let Grace, and I'll, before Grace, before you start with, with whatever social engineering you'd like to do, you have full, full reign uh, to do what you'd like. So I will I will watch the recording later. <laughs> um, and so you're in Barcelona. Yeah, exactly. Oh, fun, cool. I haven't been here in many years. Lived here for nine months in 2001. Was here when 9/11 happened. <clears throat> Very strange thing to experience somewhere else. Friend of mine visited they Barcelona. Say, they say sure. things like that. A friend of mine goes to Barcelona for a couple of weeks some years ago and said it was the hardest thing he ever did to come back home. It's a really, really beautiful city. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. I just got back from there a couple of weeks ago. Sweet. Well, I'm off. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Grace. See y'all. Cool. Go. All right, everybody. So welcome to the OGM call. I guess I'm going to record this. Oh. Somehow I'm not the host. I can't. It says the host has to give me permission. Is there a host? He said he gave me host, but I don't know. Carl is the host. Carl can record. I don't know why you're the host, Carl, but it just looks like now I'm going to have to be on my best behavior because Carl can kick me out because he's the host. So. And this made you the co-host. All right. Well, now we've got and we've got a recording going now. Great. Awesome. So, welcome to the OGM call for December first, twenty twenty-two. Um, today is supposed to be a topic, but no topics came up. But a topic did come up on the Google groups, which I wanted to explore, which is around sense making and the media and how we make sense of things in the media. So I want to do a quick round and then a longer round. And the quick round that I wanted to start with is this, I think, is an experience that's happened to many people. Um, and so do kind of a quick discussion of that and then maybe do an exercise, which will take a little bit of time out. And the, the question is, has it ever happened to you that you're reading your newspaper, your favorite newspaper, and or media outlet, whatever it may be, or one that you trust, and you read an article about something you really know a lot about? So it might be somebody who you know, or a company that you actually have inside information about, or about food systems if you're Klaus, some topic that you know about. And you read this article and you know these guys are idiots. Like you read the article and you're like, these guys got this and this and this and this wrong. And then you turn the page or you go to the next article in the newspaper that you love and they say something about something you know nothing about. And you're like, this is a great article. And you believe what is on that next page. Um, so I kind of wanted to hear reflections on that topic of like, has that happened to you? And, and where do you see yourself as possibly having been susceptible to that kind of like, even though I know that they have dubious facts on page three, when I got to page four, it was like, oh, just fine. 
Yeah, go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I'll go first because I think I could be short. Um, where I've experienced that, I hear feedback. Do you? I don't, you're muted, Grace. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I think some other people muted, which uh, fixed the problem. Okay, thank you. Where I've actually experienced that has been on live, on a live news feed, where I've seen things happen, and then I hear them reporting it, and that is not what I viewed. And how that then affects the next thing they report is they're no longer credible to me. But that's also how I deal with people. And th this is an important topic because I, this is a topic that I think that we really should take a better look at so we could figure out how we can fix it. Because I think we're all susceptible to, in our, in our collective sense making, we shut off certain people right away and drink in everything from other people. So I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you. Yeah, hi, everybody. In psychology, I learned about a concept called selective exposure. Like, say you just bought something expensive, you'll only expose yourself to information related to that product, or you'll tend to ignore other opinions. So I think that does play a part in that phenomenon. Um, personally, I have not exactly experienced that, but I could imagine scenarios where, like, um, maybe confirmation bias where I'm um, led to believe a certain way based on my experience, what I was taught in school and what I've uh, come to believe. And uh, yeah, it's tricky to know <laughs> and to, to see when it's challenged for, for me to come to terms with what is my belief now due to a challenge. Welcome, Doug. We're talking about the phenomenon in which you, um, we're talking about the media and the truth in the media and the phenomenon in which sometimes you'll read something in, in, in a publication that you respect, um, which is false. You know it's false because it's your area of expertise, but then you, when you turn the page, uh, maybe you don't, you, you just believe the next story, even though you know that they were wrong on that thing that you're an expert in. Okay, go ahead, Carl. I had, um, well, the, the, um, seems to be some resonance with like the, um, Dunning-Kruger effect too, that you don't, um, and then I've been, I've brought it up a couple of times and I've been, I'm really gonna really want to get, uh, some, uh, meeting together to talk about the, the believing game, but there's also a piece of, that's also the, a dynamic where we need, to, I mean, you, you don't, you, yeah, there, there's like a systematic way of, of um, determining whether you should, you know, the, whether you should believe something or not and, and things. It's kind of framed as a complementary to the scientific method, which is the doubting game and, and things. So um, between the two of those. And I'm also interested in uh, what Eric talked about too, if you can post a reference to it. Yeah. And I think there's been um, a deterioration of knowing, like Stacy was talking about how we feel about people and it's kind of different how we might feel about an institution like a newspaper or a publication. And then the institutions have become more and more like individuals in some ways because there's so much freelance writing and stuff like that but it still has the same headline on the top somebody was mentioning um recently this week you know jeff bezos bought the the, the washington post a few years back and it still has the exact same thing on the top it doesn't say under new ownership and now you kind of wonder like are there certain stories about retail or about cloud services that might or might not get in there, right? You don't know, it, it's, it's not in the headline about the ownership. And the same thing I remember was talking about New York Times, like that they have a history of being 
slanted against, like not hiring gay people and now they're very woke and like these changes of ownership or not changes of ownership we don't notice them over time we think we're reading the same newspaper but maybe we are and maybe we aren't uh gil go ahead yeah good morning um so to your original question yeah i have had that experience um I've also had the experience of, of of discounting everything else they write based on you know what I read about something I know about. Neither of which is you know both of which are overgeneralizations, right? But yeah, I, it's it, it's um, um, seeing coverage of stuff that I know about or that I was directly involved in really you know sort of shifted my view of how to look at media. Um, I've tried to. Um, um, in a more or less disciplined way, try to triangulate a lot. I read something and I'll go see, read other people or read other views on the subject. Um, uh, you know, I intentionally seek out contrarian views uh, or follow the thread of an article, quote some people, go see who are those people and what's their background, what other things they have written to, to try to build a larger field. Uh, of shape about what that topic is. Uh, my my friend Chauncey Bell um, says that uh, in, in his mind, one of the most important ca capacities is to is the capacity to make good assessments of other people's capacity to make assessments. <laughs> it's a little loopy, but if you if you listen it, it it's you know it, it it's very powerful. It's like everybody is making assessments or interpretations all the time. We all do that. We can't not do that. Um, and then how do we listen to how other people do that? And what's behind theirs? And what do they bring to the table in terms of their own biases, their own experience, their own perspectives? And, um, you know, and in that process, how do I listen to my own listening? You know, my own confirmation bias, where I, I like Eric's phrase about selective exposure. We all do that. Uh, so it's intriguing territory. And I will I will confess that I'm culpable of being a bad actor in this because I will sometimes I notice that I sometimes will retweet retweet things because I like the headline and I haven't read the article. <clears throat> or um, or I, you know, retweet things and notice that there is no reference to the claim being made. Uh, which is a place where I'm, I'm, I'm much more disciplined. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not inclined to propagate things where someone says something interesting, but there's no way to verify. Is it true or not, or where it comes from, or where it's sourced? Um, you know, charts that have no, no attribution to them and things like that. So it's, it's a very sloppy game out there. And I notice that I'm swept up and culpable in it and try to be really careful. Great question, Grace. Yeah, Stuart? Yeah, it's kind of um, another instance, uh, evidence of um, capitalism gone amok. I mean, here we have all of a sudden Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post, okay? What are his politics? You've got the Murdochs on Fox News. CNN is losing um, um, media attention, so they're going to move to the right, you know, because they drifted over into the left. So, um, you know, we like to think about journalism as something that's, you know, pure um, and uh, and factual, and yet it's drifted over into what I would call, you know, uh, advocacy journalism looking for the facts that justify a political position. So um, that's kind of a, a phenomenon that's just so very, very present um, in media today. And, um, you know, the choices we make about what we consume. I'm finding myself drifting more and more away from listening. Um, you know, it, it's been background noise in my own mind for a long time. I mean, background noise as I, as I go through the day. And I'm just saying, no, I, 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 um, I'd much rather listen to, you know, uh, uh, um, Leonard Cohen uh, <laughs> and feed my soul in that in that way, and then listen to because that's where the it's it's starting to show up for me. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the bottom the bottom line is choose your sources. 
choose your sources wisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting because um, I've been listening more to long form podcasts. I just realized I really want to listen to the expert talk about this quite a bit, you know, and go into it and go in and back and forth with an interviewer who is either going to ask hard questions or doesn't know anything and is asking naive questions. But like, see, does this person really know? And, I, and I've actually substituted a lot of my news for long form podcasts. And, and it's quite interesting. It's a very different bias that you get that way. And, and I, you know, I know that that those of us on the call are all kind of uh, left leaning, whatever that whatever that means, right? Um, you know, but so so periodically, I'll, I'll want to turn on Fox News to see what they're saying, and and it's just it's just insane. I mean, it's just absolutely insane what 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 you hear in those contexts. So, yeah. Uh, See, that's what's interesting to me too. Like, that's a very interesting thing, like uh, to listen to something that comes from the other side and say it's insane. To me, that's an indicator that we're missing something. If I can't understand why somebody believes something, what am I missing? Because I listen to both sides and they both sound equally insane to me. That's why I'm listening to long form podcasts. Like they both sound insane. I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's all that's insane. Um, the other thing that this comes in the context of just to kind of keep moving the conversation and add more stuff, even though I see there's some hands up, I'll get to you in a second, but is this comes in the context of, um, you know, the takeover of Twitter. And then uh, this recent post that was in the Google group about like how it's horrible that the that Twitter is no longer censoring COVID disinformation, and um, and there's there's been always a long standing um, news outlets uh, the pro censorship news outlets. Like, it's horrible that Twitter is out there. It's horrible that people are having secret conversations on Signal. It's horrible that people can say whatever they want. And somebody just commented that the, you know, the right to speech is, is limited to those who have one. And so there's this tension, right? Like, yeah, yeah. between like how, and, and I was surprised to hear how many people in this group feel like censorship on Twitter is, has been a good thing. And it's horrible that we're gonna bring back all these people who are banned from Twitter. I found that very interesting, like, like Stuart was saying, who's left and who's right? I'm like, oh, I thought we were free speech advocates on the left. I'm kind of confused now. Yeah. Klaus. Oh, Stuart, you wanna say one more thing, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say one more thing and that's, you know, um, Having a legal background, um, you know, the idea of First Amendment um, uh, has always been kind of deep in my soul. And yet, as I look around and see some of the some of the stuff that's out there, um, you know, both in the media but also in the art world, in in the in some of the films that are making, it, it, it's kind of like you know, um, my sense making. Uh, a mechanism just goes, you know, why are they throwing billions and billions of dollars into making all this junk that people are consuming? Um, is, is that opinion? Uh, is, is that is that assessment, Gil? <laughs> Absolutely, it's it's my assessment because some people love that, you know, that all the crap that's out there. But it, you know, it, it's still, I will still assert that that's an edge. That I think we might, you know, pay attention to at some point in time. If I was creating a new world, mm -hmm. <clears throat> cool, Klaus. Yeah, I'm coming back to Carl's comment about the dunning goga effect. I think there are, there is a great way to to look at uh, information that is. Now, based on your on your understanding of the of the topic, uh, misleading or, or downright wrong, but then you have to look at the intentionality behind it, right? Um, is the intention 
um, you know, that's just the best they know and they don't see their blind spots and they just don't know what the, what they don't know. Um, or uh, which is which maybe the New York Times, which maybe the Washington Post, you know, uh, putting out an article thinking they really know when they in fact, you know, have blind spots. Fox News, on the other hand, is intentionally wrong, right? It's a propaganda network. So they're misleading. There is designed misinformation to lead towards predetermined outcomes, right? We have we have modeling of, of viewers based on their socioeconomic backgrounds, where we know exactly what how they respond to, to stimuli. So that stimuli is being put out there in order to induce opinions in order to induce emotional responses. That's a different thing. But for, so for as long as, as, as uh, we're dealing with a, whether that's a media network or whether that's a conversation in social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, for as long as we're dealing with someone who is responsive to a question and here, not, not, a, not a statement, but a question, and then, and then, and then interacts with that, we're good. But unfortunately, um, there is just a lot of intentional uh, misleading. You know, and I think we have to divide that between uh, the misinformation that's born out of blind spots and, and lack of information or lack of understanding and intentional uh, misleading, the, the purposeful, which is, which is overwhelming you know, in our society because the the way that the American and the Western societies are leading instead of China, you know, making edicts or Russia, uh, we are we are uh, putting out information that uh, in, in the end of the day has the same impact. I want to just make a comment and like pause for one second on this comment, because this is exactly what I'm pointing to, that there's an assumption that the New York Times is just making mistakes, but Fox News is leading you down a path. And I don't have evidence at this moment that the New York Times is less guilty of that. And that's what I've been pointing to in this group. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that's generally true. Um, it's not so much what they misreport as to what they don't report on. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the gaps in the information that is being made available to the average American consumer are just horrendous. You know, when you, you take any topic, climate change, health, uh, political issues, yeah, but it's the absence of discussion, the absence of information that uh, an informed citizen would need to have to make to make informed decisions, you know, who to vote for, what to vote for, and so on. And so I agree that uh, you have manipulation on both sides. But in the case of Fox News, it is active misleading. It's not lacking information, it's providing misinformation, you know, that, that is intentional, uh, leading to leading to people responding. No, in, in, in very predictable ways. So I see that as a difference. I know, but I'm telling you that I don't see that. I see New York Times and Washington Post doing that exact same behavior. And I don't see people, I don't see you specifically in this moment, or a lot of the people here questioning that. Like, is the New York Times doing that? And in what realm might I be able to catch the New York Times doing that? Well, well, tell me. What, I mean, give me an example yeah. of, of... So I'll give you, you know, the ones that I'm going to pick are going to make me sound very right wing, which is hysterical to me. But one example is the Lab Lake hypothesis, which turned out to be apparently pretty true. And there was a large media um, on the left saying this couldn't be, this was, you know, zoological transmission, it didn't come from a lab. And that is important information because if it comes from a laboratory, how to treat it is very different, the implications for how we're funding those types of laboratories. And the right was the only people who were saying, hey, 
this lab leak conspiracy, oh, you know, and if you so much as opened your mouth and said, I think there's something funny about this, you, you know, and, and the mainstream media, the, and mostly the left wing media was pushing this narrative. But the you other could also, what? You could also say this was you now fuck of war kind of issues. I mean, in the middle of this turmoil, you needed to develop a national strategy on how to combat what was clearly, you know, a, a very. I don't see. I don't see any problem with. I don't see any problem with knowing the origin of this thing. Right? Did it come from China or not? Did it come from a Chinese lab that was funded by the United States? It has nothing to do with how dangerous the virus is. It nothing. Was a, it was a distraction in the middle of trying to formulate a national strategy. Now you will. But how can you formulate a national strategy when you don't know the origin in it and you can't have an open scientific conversation about it? That's but good, even good. if you're right, even if you're right, Klaus, this was still the newspapers making you believe a certain thing that turned out later to be untrue and banning anybody who would speak about it. And so that type of behavior is what you're accusing the right of doing. And I'm just saying it's the same behavior. It's the same behavior. It's not in my mind. I'm sorry. It's just Okay, cool. Let's hear it from Doug. Grace, I don't know what sources you're reading or not reading, but I've seen plenty of debate about the lab leak hypothesis. I, have. I know some people, I know there's been an attempt to shut down debate, but I've seen plenty of debate in the public media and in the scientific literature trying to figure out what's actually a very complicated question. So you saying it's been shut down, I think, is, is a bit. I extreme. say it was shut down for an entire year. Look at the dates on those things. Look at the dates. I, yeah, that's not something I'm going to research. Uh, but that's but the point. That's why I picked that because it is something that people are allowed to debate now. It's not con like it's allowed now. But for a year, it was not allowed. Well, I don't know. For you to say it's both the same. Uh, have, have you ever spent a half hour watching Tucker Carlson? Um, look, there are people on the left who are as ridiculous as that. Have you ever spent a half hour watching Tucker I have Tucker not Carlson? spent a half an hour watching Tucker Carlson, but I have spent an hour listening to podcasts that I completely disagree with, and they are I, ridiculous. I invite you. Well, Tucker Carlson has got a reach that podcasts don't have. 30%, I think, of Americans get their news from Fox News. Uh, spend a half hour there. This is not just difference of opinion. This is, as Klaus said, a concerted, focused, strategic, highly funded disinformation campaign for political purposes. Different I'm game. saying same thing. And to say they're both the same thing. Look, people say it's both say there's political violence on both sides. It's 50 times as many murders from right wing violence as from left wing violence. You can say it's both the same same thing because they both do it, but 50x is a pretty significant difference. You know? I think that's fair enough. Look, that's a fair enough thing to say, right? And Doug, sorry. To but you can see, the first thing you can see is that how sure you are that this is correct and that I'm wrong. And I'm not even like saying that I actually believe everything I'm saying. I'm just saying, looking at how difficult it is to even have this conversation about a world health issue. Because that's what the that's what the Twitter thing was about. You're now you're allowed scientists are now allowed, and anybody is now allowed to debate the health policy on Twitter, and that was banned until now. I don't know. I've seen. I've been watching the thing for what is it now? Two and a half, three years. I've seen plenty of debate all through. If you could, if you could post the dates when you think it was blacked out, I'll take a look. Okay, uh, I'll I'll take a look at that. I'm willing to do that. But look, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying my experience is different than yours. You say you haven't seen any of it. I say, well, I have. Okay. That's not telling you. I didn't say I haven't seen it. I said we didn't see it for a year. You said it so was. So I'm sorry if that was incorrect. So do we want this conversation to be. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to pass to Doug, but I, but what I'm really trying to point at is like how certain we are that the media that we're looking at is the good guys and how difficult it is to like 
even have that conversation here, which is supposed to be a very safe place. Doug. Yeah, so so I sort of I sort of turn the telescope around on this and the the thing that one of the one of the pieces that came to mind is there's a, a transformation organizational transformation person that I have a lot of respect for um and there was a guy who came out with a whole new take and twist and turn in that space. And, and she sort of respond, you know, responded to this as new and a shiny new thing. And, and I looked at it and my comment was, correlation is not causation. And he had woven a very nice condom out of correlations that really had no basis to then leap to, it's actually a source or a causative kind of thing. It was just really completely floating. And if there weren't people with an appetite for Tucker Carlson, he wouldn't be in front of a camera. And if there weren't people with an appetite for a whole package and gestalt and identity of being, you know, truth centered and value centered and moral centered, there wouldn't be a readership for the New York Times and the Washington Post. So ultimately, for my lens, it's about orientation and attachments. And people with orientations and attachments um, buy things that affirm their orientation and attachments. And the world and system that we live in is a consumer model. It's all about meeting needs and demands of people that uh, want what they want. And that can be Amazon selling crap, or it can be media and newspapers selling points of view that are reflective and affirming for the people that are receiving them. And so through that lens, it is an equivalency place. Like it's all the same. From a morals standpoint or from a values standpoint, there are differences, but those are also sort of subjective expression of individual preference and agency. And for the people, you know, drinking from the Fox cup, you know, all the statements about how more righteous and true and, and valid the New York Times are, is and the Washington Post is, um, is as obvious and extremely ridiculous and delusional to them, experientially and emotionally looking at you as you're looking at Tucker Carlson. So from, a, from a, 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 an acknowledgement recognition of humans are humans and they do them and the, their individual orientation and values determine and drive what they buy, you know, what needs they have to be affirmed uh, in media. And, and I think part of the, part of the 1950s naive, somewhat delusional holding on to um, what's true and what isn't, what's fact and what isn't. A lot of that is what's been destroyed. 
just as a social phenomena, there was enough critical mass from the people, you know, that constructed alternative facts and repeating a lie and not long enough makes it a truth for some people, which seems to do, um, that a lot of those tacit, everybody agrees with what's good, what's right, or what whatever um, governs underlying it all, I think is gone. Um, so that doesn't negate the validity of the concept of something being good on a, on a moral, on an ethical, on a social, on an empathetic level versus being bad, um, being dark. You know, religions have been in business for thousands of years because of good and evil. Like that's been their ticket. <laughs> so, um, I don't, I, I don't personally believe feeding the polarities energetically it maps to a solution. It just, you know, is it adding another, another drop to the bucket of one side or another? And the, the deeper question is, are there ways that that from a fixing and healing standpoint, are there ways we can figure out how to drop below all of that to land on an emotional level in a way that's universal and transcends all these constructed polarities that people uh, adopt? points in those are criticism, like totally is simply compelling the number. But Anybody else hearing that? I think that's John, maybe. Okay. So, so yeah, so I, I think, you know, my, actually my focus full time these days is, how, you know, what are the things that would cut underneath all of that and that would touch and emotionally energize people to reconnect with what they're feeling in ways that it's around things that could potentially be universal for everybody. Like, you know, the response everybody gets if they look at a puppy or a kitten, depending upon whether they're a cat or a dog person. So I, with that, I'll, I'll stop. So this is really brings us closer to the conversation that I want to have. It's not about whether I'm right or wrong about at what moment the debate came in. And it's not whether I'm right or wrong about you know, climate change. It's about where do we stand when we hear somebody criticize something dear and near to our hearts? For example, if I say the New York Times is a bunch of liars and they're manipulating your minds. Where do we stand on media in general? What does it mean to have censorship on tweet, tweet, Twitter or not have censorship on Twitter? And who are the mediators of that? And given the polarization, which is really what Doug is speaking about, how do we not just create safe spaces for very brave people, but create, like, when has it happened to you in this last year since the lockdowns have ended? It's about, it's a little less than a year that you've gone to somebody that you had a huge rift with because you were so right about something and said to them, you know what, I really wanna, I, I still think I'm right, but I'd like to hear your perspective. And that's not really happening very much to any of us. And that's my inquiry. Like we, we first get really offended that Elon Musk took over Twitter then we get really upset that the advertisers left and he wants to charge for it and we won't have advertisers feeding us garbage. Then we get really offended that it won't censor certain medical information or a bunch of quacks 
who knows what, who's going to, you know, that's dangerous that a bunch of quacks might be on there. Like we just, first we get offended and outraged. And, and, and that's really my inquiry. Like how, when was the last time any of us stood back and said, Hey, wait a second. Yeah, Gil. You'll have to unmute if you want to speak. You're handling up and down. I don't know. Maybe that was a mistake. With me. In the name of Ken Homer, uh, I would ask you to be clear about who you mean when you say we. Because we throw we around in all sorts of different, you know, different scopes and ranges. Um, but I also also not clear grace on what is the discussion you want to have the discussion is what do you like where are you getting your information and how much do you question it and where do you stand on censorship of information and what is the right relationship between mainstream media and social media and how do we even make sense of something in this post truth world? But it really does start at home. Like, when do I admit I'm wrong? When do I admit I'm wrong? Or, or cast doubt on the type of media that I've got in front of me? So, so for, me for me, curiosity is really important. Um, and doubt is really important. When I was, uh, geez, when I was like, I don't know, 13 or something like that. Uh, I encountered I.F. Stone. I don't know if people know of him. Uh, he was a journalist, uh, very active in the early 1960s. And his what he he started out every morning. He would uh, get the New York Times and the Washington Post and several other papers and uh, and comb through them and look for gaps and inconsistencies and omissions. Um, and write about you know offer a different perspective on the news. I mean, this was the era in which the um, through the efforts of people like him, the Gulf of Tonkin scam of the United States government was exposed. The United States claimed that North Vietnamese patrol boats had, had attacked U.S. Navy, and that was the basis for escalation of the Vietnam War, and it never happened. And it took some intrepid journalists working on top of mainstream journalists and government uh, uh, spokespeople to track that down. Um, I learned very early on from Stone that I couldn't trust everything I read in the newspapers, that it took a level of analysis and perspective uh, and mixing of points of views to dig at the truth because of manipulation, yeah, to some degree, collusion to some degree, human foibles to a very great degree, editorial, you know, um, bandwidth to another degree. Uh, but, and it was, yeah, it was widely believed at the time it happened and it took years to get that, you know, exposed. But, you know, Stone was a very powerful lesson for my formative mind, which is to read critically and to question sources and to triangulate sources, which is, you know, which I talked about before. Um, to, your, to your point about talking with people with whom I disagree, um, there's a real difference between saying, what a jerk you are and saying, that's interesting. Why do you think that? Uh, and opening up a conversation that is that recognizes that we are human beings with vastly different experiences and perspectives that are formed out of our experiences. You know, the families we've been raised in, the communities we've been raised in, who we hang out with, et cetera. And we all have these biases. So, and I've talked before, I've, I've you know, I've, in the course of, the COVID wars and the climate wars, I've become very dear friends with a guy who voted for Trump in 2016, which only happened because we were introduced by a mutual friend who said, you guys would, you know, you guys have something to talk about. And we went into an open conversation rather than a combative conversation and changed each other's minds on some things, agreed to disagree on some things and love each other deeply. Uh, and so for me, that was a, like a little window into something else that's possible. On the other hand, I couldn't have that kind of conversation with Tucker Carlson. Uh, who, you know, or people who are not interested in the conversation, but are interested in strategic manipulation of populations for political and financial power. Uh, and if you doubt that, look at how quickly Rupert Murdoch turned on Donald Trump. 
they're in a different game than the kind of game that we are all in here in this circle of, of good people on these weekly calls. And so that's part of it also is, is you know, is maybe discerning where it's possible to have real conversations with real people, which I agree with you is a much wider arena than we mostly live in. We mostly live in our little bubbles and there's a real value to opening up those bubbles. Uh, and we're in a world with some very dark forces that are not just about differences in perspective, but very differences in goals of how human beings should survive on this planet. Uh, yeah, it's really essential to distinguish between those. A friend of mine said the other day, we were talking about this, he said, I have no interest in a conversation with one of the Pointless. However, a conversation with somebody who voted for Lindsey Graham, not pointless. That's all. Yeah, Stacy. Yeah, so to echo what, what Grace and Naomi had put in the chat and Doug had mentioned, in order to have that kind of conversation that Gil mentioned with that friend, there has to be a level of awareness and an ability to recognize when you're wrong. So whatever your opinion or opinion is, if you're not the kind of person that can do that, that kind of conversation will not be possible. And I just want to share something that I wanted to bring to the call anyway, and it touches on this in many ways. I was on a Facebook page and it was um, somebody was post, it was, or he's a writer and it's a very, I would say it's a very, moderate kind of page in that there are people that move to the extremes, but it's kind of very diverse. And they were talking about the, the dinner that Trump had had with Ye and uh, whoever else. And because I noticed somebody said that he, he was obviously a Republican and he was talking about there are reasonable, reasonable Republicans. So I took that as, you know what, let me try to engage with him which I haven't really done in quite a while. And we did, and very quickly, he started talking about, well, why did Nancy Pelosi put Omar on committee? And so I just asked him, I said, well, can you tell me, you know, he, he said how vile and anti-Semitic she was. And honestly, I don't know much about her. I don't think she's anti-Semitic. And that has made people get mad because we also hear the right wing media. So I looked into it a little bit and I asked him, I said, can you, I said, can you tell me one quote she made that was anti-Semitic? And there was a very, very long pause. And finally he came back with um, a meme that said peace for Palestine. And I said, well, don't they deserve peace too? At which point he started attacking me. And he started saying that it should be on my conscience that I'm creating this hate. So I use that as an opportunity to pivot a little bit. And I said, well, then if you support, you know, first, I mean, I, again, I don't wanna draw out the story. I went very slowly to draw a connection that he was making between supporting something and then something leading to violence. And then after that connection was clear, I then asked him, so if you voted for Trump, do you take responsibility for the amount of violence that increased, you know? And he said, I told you, I don't support Trump. I said, I didn't ask you if you supported him. I asked you if you voted for him. And he said, I don't say who I voted for. Now it was very clear he voted for him. And I told him, I said, you're being dishonest. I said, I would bet my life you voted for him in 2016. And while I might not bet my life that you voted for him in 2020, I'd bet a small fortune. And he just got like really enraged. And I'm going off on a tangent, but this is important. This is why I actually brought it, wanted to bring it in, but the subject was different. I finally checked his profile and it turns out he's not a real person. And that was concerning for a lot of reasons. And what was really interesting, and that I, I was going to share it probably in the Free Jerry's Brain group, because what was really interesting at the end of this whole conversation, I had used a phrase, and then he mirrored that phrase back to me, which was really, it, like the whole thing is interesting. 
but how that ties in when you were talking earlier and there was the disagreement between why the left media or the center media, whatever you want to call it, the more responsible media, I'm going to call it, even though they do enrage me as well. There was sort of like a hard line because they were trying to mitigate the damage that was coming from misinformation. And I'm less concerned about where we draw the lines with um, like the whole free speech thing. I'm more concerned with finding out whose voice I'm really hearing because how could Facebook not know there's all these fake profiles? That should be really easy to figure out. And this, whatever it was, this person was really trying to fight with me. And if anybody would like, anybody that's on Facebook wants me to tag you in so that you can look at the thread between me and this person, because I actually think it was a very interesting thread that illustrates a lot of things. And you know, that's why I was bringing it here. It's worth talking about. But, uh, but anyway, to get to the original point, there were no facts. He couldn't give me a fact as to why she was anti-Semitic. But what I learned is this was really orchestrated by Bobart and the right wing. And it was like blown out of proportion. And the comment she made was, it's all about the Benjamins, which I would make that, we, we all say things like that. I didn't realize it was an anti-Semitic trope. I'm Jewish. She said she didn't realize it. I take her at her word. She apologized anyway. And she still was able to still support what she supports. You can, you can care about Israel and the Jewish people and still want peace for Palestinians. And I cannot tell you how many times I've been called anti-Semitic for saying that. And I served on the board of a temple. So I don't, you know, that's the end of my rant. <laughs> Thank you. This conversation is really difficult for me, and I know that it's really hard for me to stay neutral in this conversation. Grace, before you go on, I'm sorry, can I just answer what Gil put in the thread, please? Because he asked, why in the world did I engage in deep conversation with not a real person? And for that matter, why go deep with a person you don't know? So I just want to answer, this was a forum where there were a lot of people following a conversation. And I was going very, it was more about who was watching the conversation. And I was giving an opportunity for him to give something factual. I wasn't falling into the emotions. I wasn't reacting the way most people react, which drives, blows things up. That's why he was getting upset because I wasn't falling into the pattern that so many people fell into in 2016 which I think was the, the worst thing that could have happened because that's how we got siloed. So my feeling is you have to leave space for people to see who other people are. You have to leave space for their thoughts to come out so that you could see who's an idiot and who's not. The other thing is I don't usually look up who I'm talking to. When I saw how he was changing, I said, let me look and see who this is. Once I saw who he is, I called him out for, oh, I didn't realize you were a troll. I thought you were Seth's friend. Carry on. <laughs> you know, that, and that was the end of it. So I just wanted to answer that. Thanks, Grace. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I realized that it's really hard for me to stay neutral in the conversation because I don't think the health authorities did us a favor through this censorship. I don't think lockdowns proved to reduce the virus. I do think they had serious health implications for human beings and educational implications for children. And I don't think there was a healthy debate on that at the time that those things were happening. And so it's very hard for me to stay neutral on this and for me to really believe this story that it was a good thing that the media made sure that we all got a unified message for the best of our health. And I'm not neutral on that. And so 
you know, trying to moderate a conversation around like, what do you believe and what do you not believe? And where did the media steer us along? I happen to be an extremely strong free speech person. I'm happy for Twitter to be full of disinformation because I, I feel like that's part of healthy debate. And I agree with Stacy. there's a real problem with people who aren't people and how do we identify them? And it's been a mess. It was a mess before Musk and it's a mess now and there's misidentification of what is and isn't a troll and what is and isn't a bot. Um, but yeah, so I apologize for not being neutral about this. You know, I feel very strongly that healthy debate has been taken away from us. Yeah. Either Doug or Gil, I don't know. Both of you have hands up. Well, Gil, if you're, you want to respond to what Grace just said, because I'm going to zoom out you're a little muted, bit. You Gil. Um, yeah, let me just go very briefly, Doug. Thank you. Um, Grace, I have no problem at all with you not being neutral. None of us is. Um, but I would ask of you what I, you know, what I said in my previous comments, that if you're going to make claims, be prepared to document them. And you've said several times now that there's this blackout of the lab leak hypothesis. I've just been on, you know, just been browsing while you've been talking. I see lots and lots of discussion. Uh, spanning wide range of dates. So ground your, feel free to make your assertions. Absolutely. But ground them. And then we can have them. Send that information. It was, there was, it was, it was in the media that I was consuming and I will, I will provide but, but it. What I'm saying is that you're coming, you, you, you're in this conversation with a chip on your shoulder and that's okay. And you have a strongly articulated point of view and that's okay. And it's based on, on things that you have read and done it would for me it'd be much more fruitful if you came in and said here you know in this date range this didn't happen and then we can say well did it or not because we're just left with you making the assertion eight open minutes open. to show up and moderate this conversation okay. Gil, please give me a break please okay, give me a break eight I, minutes I, before the conversation nobody had stepped up to host so please I, give me a break i didn't know that i didn't know that and i will happily give you a break on it but i have the sense that you've held this perspective for quite a while um, and I think we all of us, this is part of the, to your macro question, how do we engage in discussion about these things? Let's have our opinions. Yes, let's be respectful. Yes, let's ground them so that we can unpack things and learn together. That's all. I'm really, I'm sorry, Doug. <laughs> I'm really bothered by the chip on the shoulder thing. I really am. Because I think we all kind of feel that there's some sort of bias. And I, I that made me uncomfortable. I have, I have to say, it, yeah, I, I just have to, I, I'm done. I just needed to release that. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to share, it's, it's not a long story, but, um, so, so I have an energy healer who I love and she's in Colorado and, and she had, you know, we chit chat and she shared about how she was in the process of withdrawing herself from the United States that what we would associate with the U, what is the U.S., that she was somehow withdrawing from that. And, and I wear a bunch of hats, but one of them is I'm a lawyer. And I was fascinated. And I was like, do you have some material on that? Like, could you send me some stuff? And it took a while. And she sent me, finally got me some links to some sites and to some documents. And, you know, I, you know I'm fundamentally a liberal New York Jewish kid, right? And I started digging into this and reading this stuff and, and went all the way to the bottom. And it was breathtaking how the story of it, the, the pseudo construction of it, 
had so much verisimilitude to reality, but with twists and turns with constructs and connections and, and correlations that I was, it was breathtaking. I was blown away. It was nuanced. It was elaborate. It was deep. And it literally created in total a whole alternative United States of America. Almost, you know, it's like one of those movies where all of a sudden there's a parallel world that pops into place and it's identical, but it's not identical. It was that. And it was elaborate and it was complex and it was nuanced. And the differences were little trim tabs and you added them all up. And at the end of the daisy chain, if you filled out this form and submitted that and did this and did that and whatever, you two could effectively quit your membership, your citizenship in that version, and you could join this new one. And on completion of this review, it completely changed my orientation, my understanding of that 30 or 40% Fox drunk the Kool-Aid Trump following and how, you know, how not, quote, the deplorables these people were. They were taken in and it's misguided. But I could see some really bright educated people reading all of this, buying all of this and, and feeling completely intelligent and reasoned and discerning in doing so. And, you know, my experience these days is like, it's all about the questions because if I can understand how somebody is where they are, then at least I'm starting from where they are with a full non-judgmental, non-colored appreciation of why they are, how they are, where they are with what they're saying as a, as a starting place. And um, it took all of the heat out. It took all of the judgment stuff out. It took all of the, my projection out and left me with, you know, these people are, you know, they have a reality, fully dressed, fully adorned, fully elaborated and grounded in like just enough verisimilitude stuff to be credible, plausible, persuasive to somebody who's highly educated, pretty bright, ethically and morally centered to buy it. It's not just uneducated, poor, you know, white people. It's not. And, and um, that's the world we're in. That's the world we're in. And, and I love Stacy's like cherry on the Sunday is, and now we have bots <laughs> that are indistinguishable. We've hit the Turing test, right? That are indistinguishable from real people with AI engines that can 
be on a mission to whip you up and we'll whip you up. Even with subtle twists and turns of concession and change in tactic, they're really smart. They're really capable. And um, yeah, it's, 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 I, it, ha the, the, the answer is in the, what we have in common as human being, ex beings experientially and emotionally, that is, I think, the only orientation we can take for figuring out how to, how to cut through all of that. So, complete. First of all, I definitely, there's some really interesting evidence uh, and interesting work by um, uh, Robert Epstein out of Washington, which shows how very subtle changes in your search engine results will lead you down very different paths of truth. I'm also noticing that I'm being held to a very rigorous standard of the proof that I have to bring, and I've never seen anybody else held to that standard in this room. And I'm, you know, I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate it. Just because I have a minority opinion, I'm being held to a higher standard. Is that why? I don't know. Why am I being held to a higher standard? I've never heard anybody in this room say before, bring your evidence. Never. And we all know that our search engines are biased. And so when you search for something and don't find it, why are you surprised? But that's the point, like that, that's exactly the point that Doug makes. We're all so fucking sure that we're right. And what I'm experiencing among my peers, among my family, among everybody, is this certainty that they're right and I'm wrong. And no curiosity. I'm not certain I'm right. I'm certain I'm being manipulated just like all the rest of you. But it doesn't seem that anybody else here feels that, you know, like, it just feels like I'm still being held to this standard. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, um, I was just going to say that with the, um, with the absolute truth that, that search engines and, you know, YouTube suggestions push us toward um, extremes of certainty. I mean, like I, I was, I was posting in the chat that I like make a practice of what I referred to was, you know, watching Fox news or watching MSNBC, but that's not actually what I do. I watch them on YouTube. And because my world is more of an MSNBC world, you know, my, my cohort, um, I would naturally get more of that, would naturally get more, you know, late night monologues from Colbert and, you know, Kimmel that, that skew um, liberal. And when I make a point of watching some Fox stuff, just because I want to know, you know, what, what's being said, um, the thing I mentioned in the chat was that there are, there are, you know, little, little non-representative truths seized on more often for outrage purposes. It happens a little more often on Fox than it does on MSNBC, but MSNBC does it too, holding up, you know, this thing that happened you know, with outrage, just <laughs> for the surety of that. And the other thing that happens with, with YouTube when I'm watching that Fox stuff is I get pushed toward the smug certainty of, you know, a Ben Shapiro video or a 
Um, I mean, you know, it's it's like the, the, they want the, the 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 way the algorithms are constructed is like, oh, you think this not very well made point is interesting? Let me show you somebody who who's more likely to be persuasive, who speaks better in that same mindset. And I, I mean, I think that's really interesting. And I think it pushes us out of the, the centered, I mean, I would say IF Stone style skepticism. I don't know how skeptical, I mean, IF Stone didn't live in a time where he had to be skeptical of people who were far to the left of him. But um, the, the, centered, and I don't mean politically centered, though it ends up being politically politically centered, centered skepticism about anything anybody is saying, and happily living in a world where we have to triangulate to find the truth just the way we would if we were in the wild, you know, I mean, it just like, oh, this indicator says, you know, it's getting the weather is going this way, but then this indicator says that, how do I like figure out which route I should take and let me get to some higher ground, whatever it is, you know, you got to triangulate to figure out what's real. It's not black and white. Um, and the way that the attention economy works is pushing us toward more extreme positions of certainty. And I don't, I don't think that that is, um, I don't think that's so much in our nature as it is something that we're being nurtured toward. Um, and it sucks. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, first off, Grace, I. I really don't want to cause you any suffering. And I'm sorry if I've contributed to that for you. Um, yeah, so that. Um, we're all being manipulated. I get that. Um, we're all living with very, very partial information, which is what humans always do, but now in a very complex world with some very powerful big actors. Uh, you know, I mean, people are starting, one of the things that I'm noticing in, in the feeds that I see <laughs> is, um, is, a, um, is a rising uh, resentment about billionaires. And the power they hold, and uh, you know, I I like the, how Bezos plays the Washington Post better than I like how Musk plays Twitter. But I don't like that there are these single guys who have this enormous power, and I'll include Xi Jinping in that, and Putin and others. And you know, and it's a this is a cybernetic as well as a political perspective. Uh, Ross Ashby's law of requisite variety back from whenever that was tells me that, you know, you can't manage complexity with very narrow bandwidth. You just can't, uh, you know, and the, and the guy at the top who knows nothing from the field is making all the decisions. And it's a dangerous, dangerous situation, whether it's capitalist or communist or fascist, whoever is doing that. Um, and end of that rant. Um, um, what's the other thing I was going to say on this? Um, I, I don't mean to be holding you to a higher standard, but you said early on um, that there was a blackout of the lab leak hypothesis. I said, in my experience, there wasn't. I've seen lots of stuff about it. You then said there was a year in which there was nothing. And I said, can you tell me when? That's it. I don't think that's holding you to a higher standard. I think it's asking you to be clear about your assertion when my lived experience is very different than yours. So we have a difference in perception. And the only way to get past that is to say, let's kind of look behind uh, what our perceptions are, how we form them, see what we can learn from that. Um, the New York Magazine article you, you posted is, is helpful. Um, 
And it tells a slightly different story. I don't read that as a story of blackout, but it's a story of, uh, you know, uh, self-referential media bias and the mainstream moving into pretty quick lockstep in what was a very terrifying time when people were eager to get quick answers to things. And yeah, and uh, should they have done it that way? Maybe not. Um, but it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a bit of a different nuance than where we started. And that was helpful to have that. Um, you know, for not choosing my words, words more carefully, and at that time, there were a lot of scientists who were losing their jobs over, over stepping out of line. And the same was true for like the Great Barrington Declaration, and scientists and, and doctors, there's actually a case, I think it's in Louisiana State a Court now about collusion between the federal government and Facebook to censor certain materials. And people were losing their jobs over this and saying that they thought lockdowns were a bad idea. And, and, and the fact that there were hundreds of medical professionals and academics who thought that was not covered, I'll call it not covered well. And, um, and apparently it appears that there was correspondence between Facebook and the Biden administration about what would be okay for Facebook to publish. Uh, which apparently is is unconstitutional. Well, that would well that would, that would suck if that's what happened. Um, I'll I'll also just note for the record that uh, Trump uh, kicked a lot of butt at the CDC early on and prevented them from acting like scientists early on, and you know and, and, yeah. and they, have, they may have dis, may have you know done serious permanent damage to the CDC. And, and and even Trump's behavior at the beginning of his administration and how he spoke about the press and didn't let them into press meetings. I mean, these things are really serious. Um, these are all serious strikes against free speech. And then even something like having Trump banned from Twitter sends a message to every world leader of every country about who's in power. That's not a good thing. You know, like, even if it was the right move, it doesn't send a good message about who gets to decide. These are all very strange, and and I think that's my concern. But also, it is like like, and I appreciate like this conversation, right? Like, I appreciate being able to say, "Hey, I feel uncomfortable," and I appreciate our ability to apologize to each other. I think that's what brings the conversation forward and creates this ability to say, "Oh, wait a second, I didn't mean to yeah. get anybody upset here." <laughs> yeah, Stuart. I need to say one other thing before Stuart. Yeah, um, I'm I'm a free speech fundamentalist. Um, I'm you know I'm 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 you know, going to my you know when when Constitution says Congress shall make no restriction of freedom of speech, it means no. Um, and that's where I, that's where I start. On the other hand, I'll claim it's a freedom of speech. And there is no fire, uh, which is what Trump did. Uh, and Trump and Trump is a mob boss, heads a mob family, um, you know, lies for a living. Um, should he have the same access that you have, uh, given the damage? It's a pretty difficult question, and I, I lean toward the side of well, no. In extreme cases, uh, and a public health emergency is one. Kind of Case. War is another kind of extreme case. There are extreme cases where uh, freedoms get confined, and it sucks, and it's dangerous, uh, and it should be very, very minimal. But that's part of what we have to grapple with. Um, um, Stuart, thank you for letting me rant ahead of you. Um, I'll stop. Yeah. yeah, and I would agree with that. And at the same time, it's like, but who decides, right? Go ahead, Stuart. No, no worries. Um, <laughs> so. It, it's really interesting that we're all trying to make sense out of an insane world. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, you know, that's kind of just, just we, what we're trying to do here. And most of us have a similar um, perspective. You know, no doubt most of us were probably excited when the Soviet Union fell apart. We all thought, yay, liberal democracy is going to reign and we're going to have a world that makes sense going forward. And there won't be, you know, strong men just exerting their power or strong people or whatever. 
And, you know, here we are 30 years later and, you know, all the authoritarian power hungry forces are showing up in both political and also in, um, in media ways today. And I find myself just, you know, more and more not no longer able to 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 kind of take it all so seriously um just i just you know i can't because because uh, you know um a, a great example okay joe biden down home joe biden from scranton pennsylvania with all his pro union stuff what did he just do he championed legislation <laughs> to avert a, 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 a strike uh, against you know, the freedom of unions to do what unions do, just at a time when, when I think union activity is becoming more and more important because of the amazing um, distance between people at the top of the economic peri uh, pyramid and those at the bottom and the fact that real, real wages haven't changed since the 1970s. So, uh, I just I I I find myself more and more not getting exercised um, over too many things. I just wanted to throw that out into the uh, into the mix, and also something that I put on chat, but just before I left and came back, and that was that you know um, truth, you know the truths that we see are so much a function of the belief systems that we have, and the belief system we have generated by the you know, the lives that we've lived and the foundational backgrounds and the unconscious programming that we're all uh, subject to. Imagine if we had a few people on this call that were raised in the ghetto, um, how they would be responding to what we were all saying and, and how their perspectives would be um, so extremely different, um, i.e. there's a way in which uh, we all take media and politics at with some degree of seriousness and people would 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 just have a completely different um perspective on that so um there's my little rant mm -hmm. go ahead stacy and maybe like could you just start a round of checkouts yeah i'm glad Stuart brought up the word truth because when I've been bringing it up over the past four years, I'm always led into this, well, what is truth? And my point is a person's truth needs to be through with, like all of their truths need to line up for them, their own truths. So for example, this person or bot or whatever that I was talking to, his truths, weren't even in alignment with what he was saying. And for me, that's where we need to focus um, because that's, our, we, and I am gonna generalize, our job is to catch our own hypocrisies. And at least if we can focus on, am I being truthful within me? And we learn to reflect that and help each other. That's a starting point. I, I, and I don't know if any of you have watched The Vow on um, HBO Max. It's the story of, have you? Because I really would like to have a call about this because I think it touches on a lot of, so very quickly, it's um, executive, what was it? ESP, Executive Success Program. It was that organization which, which turned out to be a cult but i don't believe it started that way actually when i first started watching the sessions i looked it up i was like i wonder if this is related to landmark i mean there were a lot of things that were very there's a lot of truth in that the techniques i resonated with a lot of them but the red flags are there so if anybody wants to if anybody wants to watch it and have a conversation about it it ties into this because somewhere along the way, we stop thinking. And I'm more concerned in how do, we, how do we constantly make sure we're thinking, going to Grace's original question about we're reading the source that we believe. How do we make sure we're still questioning that source that we still believe? And 
to me, that's where everything starts. So that's my checkout because I, I actually was able to talk about the two things that have been on my mind. <laughs> so thank you. Great. Julian, would you like to do a check in and check out? Uh, what, what's the check out? It means just whatever you want to say to wrap up because we're we're coming towards the end. Ah, okay. Um, well, Eric just replied to me in the chat, and I was going to um, point out, yeah, Benny wrote it, but that's because when they made the Constitution, they re relied on men of honor, right? And we don't have any of those in our government anymore. Men with no honor don't honor the checks and balances that were built into the Constitution. And that's why I say it wasn't a rigorous protection mechanism. Uh, let's see. In terms of check in, uh, I'm still, I was in Europe for a few weeks and then I got back, I'm catching up on things and preparing for the next trip because uh, I have to have a solid proposal to get together, which involves knowledge. Well, what I've been talking about for the last few years, which is knowledge management using experiential technologies based on cognitive science. Right. <laughs> Uh, is my audio dead? I don't hear anything. No, we can hear you. Good. I think you stopped speaking, and so I was thinking you were ready for us to pass it to the next person. Maybe you want to just pass it to the next person when you're complete. Well, it was such a dead silence that I didn't think I overwhelmed everybody so much they couldn't think of anything to say. Actually, it's Grace. Grace, it's your mic that is spotty. When you start speaking, it's often very, very quiet for the rest of us. It's in. I have noticed that through the call. So, oh, all right. Well, yeah, earlier would have been a better time to tell me. No, I mean, I just put it together that. Okay. Okay. Cool. It always fits in. It just, there's sort of a delay. When you lean in like that, it's fine. Okay. So, Michael, uh, Julian, did you have something else to say or? No. Okay. Michael, do you want to check out since you were speaking? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation. I feel like um, you, you know the 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 lust for confirmation, the confirmation bias that we all have that says um, I don't know. I, I, I've I've noticed lately that. Um, as there's, um, are, there are protests in China against um, repressive, uh, you know, anti-COVID anti mandates, you know, that involve, I mean, it's just a repressive situation up there, which is much easier for Western liberals to see as right when it's not very different from what some on the right here were doing, but you know, that's a repressive regime. And so we don't really, we don't talk about it the same way. We, we, we're, we're more accepting of it. And, and that's just an example of, you know, there are places, I mean, it, it, it also relates to, um, uh, when a mass shooting fits a script that that makes it really easy to say gun control would have done something about this or when the shooter is a white racist instead of you know a person of color it, it get it gets handled different ways in our heads because of our own confirmation biases and i'm willing to question that and just wish that we all were a little bit more. It would be a better skeptical place to come for. It doesn't change my political views, but I'm I'm just I'm noticing all the time that I have a hard time with this with self righteousness on on either side. Even if I feel like the people who are have my political point of view are more correct, um, the self righteousness doesn't help the argument. 
that's my checkout. Yeah, I love what you said about the Chinese, the riots in China. And I remember at the January 6th um, riots, there was some newspaper, I think it was in Europe, it might have been the New York Times, though, but that wrote about them using the exact same facts, but as if it had been an African country, what we would have written. And it was very revealing. Yeah. Uh, who else would like, anybody else want to do check out? Eric, Stuart, Gail, Gail? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of skepticism and curiosity. That's sort of how I approach this conversation. And that includes skepticism about my own beliefs, because I don't, I don't always agree with myself. Um, um, I'm, um, I think truth is a really difficult word. Uh, we use it very casually, um, but, um, you know, there is no truth in science. There's hypotheses. Um, there's, there was a line in that New York Magazine article that talked about the false hypothesis. Well, there's no false hypothesis. There's hypotheses. They're tested. We learn. We revise. And there's no truth in politics. You know, there's, there's opinions and judgments exercised, and they succeed, and they fail, and they please people and piss people off. There's no truth there. Um, um, and I'm really wary of both sideism of saying that because the world is messy and people screw up, that therefore everything's the same and everything's bad. And um, Julian, with respect, you know, I, I like what you said about the Constitution and people of honor. And when you know, when, when the signers of the Declaration pledged their lives, their trust, their sacred honor, they were really serious about that. And you know, if you look at what happened to those signers, I mean, there's, there's some interesting part of the history of those of those men who signed that thing, and they and their families suffered pretty heavily for their commitment uh, uh, to their beliefs. Uh, and so, um, um, to say nobody in government has any sense of honor or commitment to the Constitution anymore. <laughs> Broad, to me is a pretty broad overstatement because for all I disagree with Joe Biden and you know, the Democrats in Congress and so forth, it looks pretty different to me than how Mr. Trump and his folks uh, dealt with the Constitution. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm you know, very much for criticizing both sides, all sides uh, as necessary, but uh, I'm really weary of false of, of, of the of the of the everybody does it everything's the same perspective because I think that loses us uh, the insight that we really need in these times. And yeah, uh, definitely, Gil. I would say that pigeonholing is something people love to do and is almost always inappropriate. You know, you, are you left? Are you right? Are you blue? Are you red? And all that. It's like no, just about every issue we talk about is a continuum. You don't get to say it's this or this and only those two possibilities. Yeah. One thing I wanted to disagree with and you about. And, giving it's, and, it's, and it's complicated. You know, um, um, yeah. Michael, you talked about Biden and the rail strike. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. And, you know, 600,000 people out of work across the country is a problem. You know, it's like it's none of us would like to be president, <laughs> you know, because you get to make really difficult decisions every day and you will screw up and you will piss people off. And just like even even at the very best. Anyway, Julie, I'm sorry. You were, were going to go on. Uh, there were two things I was going to say. There are circumstances where it's possible to say this is wrong and this is right. For example, the theory of relativity. Th this is not a discussion item. Theory of gravity is also not a discussion item. Um, and then the other thing is that, yeah, not everybody in politics has become uh, well, lacks men of honor. Not everybody. But enough key people in key positions <laughs> like that so the sense of honor that it, it creates lots and lots of problems. So does anyone want to say something just to wrap it up? I liked what, what Eric said in the chat. That was great. Does anybody want to fight with me about the theory of relativity? So. Oh, I totally do, but I don't think that it matters. I'll just note that there's a theory of relativity and a law of gravity, so we'll pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> I think like the theory of relativity after Gil had his talk uh, in the context of the talk about uh, moral relativism, uh, you know, I thought that was a really great thing to bring up. But yeah, Eric, do you want to wrap up or someone else? Uh, I'll just share a quip 
<laughs> and the little quip that's popping up in my mind is that um, uh, trying to make sense is nonsense. <laughs> I love that. That's a perfect, perfect wrap. <laughs> that's a great piece of, of poetic, I think. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just spin that a little bit, Eric. And it's, there's, there's no sense in trying to make sense. <laughs> Well, Good. thank you, everybody. Thanks for a great conversation as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Grace. Thanks, Grace. Thanks for taking some fire. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> can dish it out and I can take it. <laughs> Bye, Bye, guys. Everybody. Bye, everybody.